Welcome to Lecture 2 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we'll present a general overview of software defined radio technology, as well as focus on one specific platform that will be used extensively in this course, namely the Universal Software Radio Peripheral, or USRP. Software defined radio technolo uh, technology, its capabilities and its limitations, are very closely coupled to computing technology. So if we take a closer look at the evolution of the computer and microelectronic technology, we see that there are significant advances in computer technology over the past several decades. We've gone from computing systems that took up whole rooms to now computing systems that fit in wristwatches, in very small form factor smartphones, um, in uh, uh, soda dispensing machines, and uh, in automobiles and elsewhere. And as a result of these advances and in innovations in computing technology, we now have microprocessor systems that are faster, more powerful, energy efficient, compact, and a number of other very desirable traits that can be used in several sectors, including the communication sector. In particular, over the last couple of decades, we have seen how this sort of computing technology has been adopted into communication systems engineering in order to implement some or even most of the baseband radio functionality that are contained within a communication system. These types of communication systems that implement all the baseband functionality using software or some sort of programmable logic is referred to as a software defined radio or SDR. In general, there are three basic types of microprocessing systems that are available for software-defined radio systems. The first is the general purpose microprocessor. This is a type of processor that we find in our computers and laptops and such, and, 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 and in general have several very desirable traits, such as it's very reconfigurable and it's accessible to some sort of human user in terms of implementing whatever, whether it's a, you know Excel spreadsheet or a radio design using some sort of simulation or design software. On the other hand, general purpose microprocessors are not really specialized for mathematical computational approaches and they're not very power efficient in most cases. The second type of a uh, microprocessor system is the digital signal processor or DSP. In this case we have that same sort of accessibility as in the case of the general purpose microprocessor. However a DSP is very much well suited to performing mathematical computations and also is power efficient in many uh, applications including your cell phones which the latest versions do contain a DSP chip inside them for performing a variety of operations such as filtering and speech processing. On the other hand, these types of processors are potentially computationally expensive and, and, and not very fast relative to the general purpose microprocessor system. Now, the last of the three that we'll be looking at um, of the basic type of microprocessor systems is the Field Programmable Gate Array, or FPGA. This is a slightly different beast than the first two, in the sense that um, the level at which you uh, sort of design and interact with this type of processor um, deals more, is, is much more closer to the hardware, to the metal um, of that processor relative to the other two. So as a result, in addition to this type of processor being very computationally powerful, um, it in many cases, it's also very difficult to implement designs and such on an FPGA because of how low level uh, the, the interaction must be between the human designer and the platform itself, as opposed to a general purpose microprocessor or DSP. Furthermore, FPGAs tend not to be very power efficient as well. So as you can see from these three types of processor systems, that, that they're both pros and cons to each one of them. In this course, we'll be focusing on using a general purpose microprocessor in order to implement software-defined radio designs 
entirely using um, a commercial, commercially available software suite called Simulink um, that will implement these digital communication systems and then use a software-defined radio that's connected to them to transmit these signals over the air to another radio. So what is a software-defined radio? Well, simply put, a software-defined radio is a communication system that has reconfigurable and reprogrammable attributes where the hardware for that radio system remains the same, but its functionality can be changed in software or the programmable logic, depending on what sort of processing technology is being used. So as a result, um, what happens is we have a single hardware platform, but if we want to implement a specific type of communication system, we can implement it all in software and that radio will perform um, true to its programming uh, to that communication system design. As opposed to what we call a hardware radio, where if you want to change um, uh, the, the functionality of the radio, you literally have to change the hardware components that compose that radio platform um, in order to uh, modify how it operates. Software-defined radios also possess some degree of control um, over its hardware, especially what we call the radio frequency front ends or, uh, or RF front ends, where um, we can actually have the software tune some of the hardware components that are not, let's say, can be implemented in software, but can be controlled through some sort of, let's say, uh, um, microelectronic mechanical systems or MEMS or some other sort of um, uh, hardware that can be tuned using software um, programs. So key features of software-defined radios relative to, let's say, hardware radios are the following. The first is multifunctionality, and, and, and again, this sort of emphasizes that reconfigurable, um, uh, re reprogrammable attributes of the software-defined radio platform, as opposed to a hardware radio, where if we wanted to change functionality, we would have to unsolder components or unplug components and plug in new components. Um, a software-defined radio uh, and its multifunctionality means that if we don't like a certain operation, we want the radio to implement a new function, we will literally just download into memory um, the, the new design, if you will, in software, and then afterwards uh, be able to um, take that design and, and, and click execute and run that instead of the current one and have a completely new operation using the exact same hardware. Global mobility um, essentially is, 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 almost, is, is almost the same um, with the exception that um, we're very specific. Like let's say not even the, the functionality, but let's say we want to implement a completely different standard uh, using uh, that platform. This is doable. Suppose we're in the US and we have one type of cellular communication standard and we want to implement that using um, our software-defined radio. Then we take a flight to Europe and they have a completely different communication standard. And what we want to do is we just reprogram the software-defined radio to use that new standard. Ta-da! So that way we have some sort of multimodal type of platform. Compactness and power efficiency? Well, it, it, and it, just the fact that with a single radio, we can implement several different types of implementations. This is fantastic because um, in the old days, if you wanted a radio to support multiple standards or multiple operations, you literally had to have a separate card, if you will, that's installed in that radio platform. So if you wanted five different uh, standards or five different types of operations, you would have five cards that would plug in uh, to some sort of common bus and then it would be selected based on what the user wants. And that definitely is not power efficient. There's also, it's definitely not going to be compact. As a, as a different, as if we now look at a software defined radio, this is totally different because now with a software defined radio, um, if I want a new standard, I would just, um, you know, uh, take from memory the, the new standard. Uh, run it in the radio software and ta-da, we have our new standard. Same hardware, we didn't have to have multiple different versions of hardware, we just have the same hardware, different code. Ease of manufacturing, 
um, instead of having a process where we solder uh, different components together onto a PCB and, um, and, 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 and have rather complicated designs, imagine if it's just a one chip solution. Everything that you want in terms of radio is just implemented on a single DSP or a single FPGA or a single uh, general purpose processor. Fantastic. And then finally, ease of upgrading. So suppose that I'm a, uh, uh, you know, uh, some sort of service provider and you have some phone that's a software defined radio. And suppose I, I, I'm suddenly offering 5G cellular service and your phone at the moment only supports 4G. How would I upgrade your phone? I would essentially do a firmware update, boom, your phone now can support 5G. If, if let's say your phone is not a software fine radio and you want to upgrade to 5G, buy a new phone. So remember that those diagrams that I drew in the previous lecture of the basic building blocks of a digital communication system, both transmitter and receiver. We call this a transceiver. Well, where is that dividing line between the software world where all that baseband functionality is implemented using software or programmable logic and the analog hardware world where we can tune some things, but in all, in all essence, we can't really program anything. And so let's, let's look at that again a little bit more closely. So let's revisit our communication system drawing from the last lecture. So we had a binary source. We had a source encoder. We had a channel encoder. We had a modulator, um, digital to analog converter. RF front end, and then at the receiver, almost the exact opposite, right? So what we see is, and you know, there are some blocks that I'm leaving out here for the most part. So operations that focus primarily on the binary information um, can be done in software or programmable logic, right? So uh, obviously we have, you know, the source that's, that's digital. So that's digital. Um, the source encoder, it's totally a digital process, uh, bits in, bits out. So that's digital. Um, channel encoder, same deal. Even the modulator, the mapping from binary digits to waveform parameters, that's digital. So the, and however, at the other end, um, the digital to analog converter, that's kind of like the boundary between what we can do in the digital domain and actual signal waveforms that are in the analog domain. And the RF side, even though it can be digitally tunable, um, it is an analog process, like the f filters and mixers and power amplifiers and low noise amplifiers and, and the whole nine yards, that's all an analog hardware process. So the boundary between your uh, the digital world and the analog world is at the analog to digital converter. And likewise, mirroring that, but at the receiver, so this is your transmitter, and that is your receiver, we have the same deal, analog and digital. And it's this digital part that can be implemented using software uh, and or programmable logic, like an FPGA. Same thing here. The digital can either be implemented in software and or programmable logic. Okay. Uh, there are a few companies out there that produce um, what they call digital RF. And the reason why we, we, we go to the analog domain is it's really difficult 
um, especially like you know, especially if we try and do like digital modulation and bring it up to some sort of carrier frequency. So we move it from DC to some frequency offset in the digital domain. To do that um, um, on the order of gigahertz, like you know, to do a, um, a frequency shift on the order of gigahertz, we have to bring that into the analog domain. Unless you have um, a, a superb analog to digital, digital analog converter, and those tend to be very expensive, and um, sometimes ne even need to be liquid cool because they run pretty hot. Um, nevertheless, uh, most communication systems sort of possess this sort of um, layout where um, the uh, the baseband functionality. So until you hit the digital to analog and analog digital converters, um, this is our baseband functionality. This is where we play around with the creation of those waveforms and the data that's uh, super uh, mapped to it. Uh, and while uh, the conversion to some sort of RF frequency, that's done in the analog, the hardware world that we see over here. So software defined radio has a history that extends all the way until the 1970s. At that time, Computing technology was advanced enough that it can support implementing some very basic baseband functionality for these radio systems. The term software-defined radio was first coined by Joseph Mitola in 1991. However, this technology did exist before Mitola coined this term, uh, at least by a couple of decades. The first major push for software-defined radio technology was the Speakeasy project, which was supported by the United States Department of Defense. This software-defined radio platform initially leveraged um, digital signal processing, or DSP technology. However, a following Speakeasy 2 radio actually combined the um, uh, DSP computing devices along with a set of FPGAs. This platform was developed in order to support interoperability between several standards used by U.S. military forces and can support transmissions with carrier frequencies ranging from 2 MHz to 2 GHz. However, given that this is the 1990s, um, the size and capabilities of these computing devices, um, as well as the hardware supporting all of it, was rather not compact and in fact the entire Speakeasy project fit in the back of a truck. Nowadays, we, do, we have numerous options to choose from in terms of SDR technology. Um, this slide shows several um, such options that one can choose from in, in case uh, one is interested in implementing communication systems using SDR technology. The first is the Joint Tactical Radio System, or JTRS. This is a military software-defined radio program that has been around for several years and is supported by the United States military. Um, this is a huge program. There are numerous companies that are working on it. And what it's trying to do is eventually uh, enable SDR to be used by most military forces in the United States. The next three uh, SDR platforms, the Berkeley B2, the Rice University Warp, and the Kansas University Agile Radio are all university-focused uh, university SDR projects, uh, as is, the, in, in other words, uh, it, these software-defined radios were, were most likely sponsored by um, uh, some sort of external source, um, either government or industry or combination of the two, or maybe a consortium. And um, it, up to the university researchers and research engineers and graduate students uh, to construct uh, these SDR platforms. And each one um, had a very specific niche um, uh, that, that it was uh, uh, focusing on. Finally, the last software-defined radio platform in this list, the Universal Software Radio Peripheral, or USRP, uh, was initially developed by Edis Research LLC, which is a small company located in, um, in Silicon Valley in California. Uh, however, recently it was acquired by National Instruments. However, um, Edis Research still exists and continues to produce uh, a family of products based on the USRP. The USRPs are relatively inexpensive 
software-defined radio platforms. As opposed to, let's say, many other software-defined radio systems that are out there that, are, that can be purchased, the USRP really is targeting uh, folks in both the academic communities as well as, let's say, some amateur groups like radio astronomy and, and such, um, and yet still provides that flexibility for implementing uh, digital communication systems uh, on these platforms, but without um, a very large price tag. Uh, for instance, um, the USRP-1 um, is currently available for at a cost of $750, while USRP-2 or USRP N210 usually is just under $2,000 in cost, which is relatively inexpensive compared to other SDR platforms currently out there. Um, what makes these software-defined radios um, so affordable is the fact that most of the baseband processing is not actually conducted on the USRP at all. In fact, the, there is a computer host, such as your laptop or desktop computer, that runs some sort of software that implements the baseband functionality of a digital communication system. And then what happens is the USRP attaches to this computer host. Uh, essentially, uh, the P in USRP, the peripheral, literally the USRP acts as a radio peripheral to the computer host. So once the baseband processing is completed, um, the information that's generated is sent over whatever sort of uh, interface um, that's connected to the USRP and the computer to the USRP. It is then filtered and resampled and then upconverted to radio, to radio frequencies and then broadcasted over the air. And so that's why the USRP is so affordable because most of the uh, baseband processing is actually done off-platform, and this and USRP actually acts as um, as some sort of uh, um, um, attachment to the computer to enable the wireless uh, transmission capabilities of a software-defined radio. Um, since it's really difficult to support a very wide range of transmission frequencies. Um, uh, due to a number of reasons, like you know, whenever uh, you design um, a radio frequency front end that supports transmission at one frequency, um, to have it operate at another frequency that might be several orders of magnitude away um, uh, could, could result in a very drastic redesign of that radio frequency front end. So as a result, the USRP um, has a modular approach to supporting different radio frequency bands. Um, so, in fact, um, if you want to operate in 0 to 100 megahertz, you use one type of uh, RF frequency uh, front end, which is implemented on something called a daughter card. On the other hand, if you want to operate in the 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz ISM band, you use a different type of daughter card. So you remove one daughter card, install the desired one in the USRP in order to operate in that frequency. Uh, however, recently, in the last several years, um, uh, EDIS Research has produced several RF daughter cards that can actually support rather wide bands of RF frequencies, as we will see in the next few slides. So let's look at the USRP concept a little bit more closely, shall we? So what the USRP does is, um, suppose you have some sort of wireless signal uh, so suppose we're treating the USRP in the host computer as um, essentially a receiver. Um, and so there's these like, you know, um, uh, wireless signals in the air. Okay. And it's received by an antenna. Okay. And so they're picked up, they're intercepted by the antenna. And it's fed into the uh, USRP block. Okay. So that's our USRP. Right. So uh, what's happening? Um, the USRP, um, what it's going to do, for the most part, is so it has an RF stage. And what the RF stage is, it takes the, the signal. So step one is it, it, it takes intercepted signal and brings down to baseband i.e. it brings it down to zero hertz as a center frequency, DC. Then what it does is it does the analog 
to digital conversion. And so depending on, um, um, on your choice of A to D, D to A, um, in this case, the analog to digital, digital analog conversion, converter on the USRP N210 is 400 mega samples per second. Which, so what happens is, so how does this look like? So if you have something that looks like this, right? That's your DC waveform. Um, what ends up happening is the AD, ADC will essentially sample it um, at a rate of 400 mega samples, right? So 400 million samples per unit time in seconds. So that guy is going to look like right? It's going to look like a gajillion samples. And then what happens is the FPGA, that Spartan 3A, what it does is uh, it performs a variety of sampling and filtering operations. And what we're doing here is um, that gigabit ethernet and the computer host um, potentially could may potentially not be able to handle that many samples being produced by the USRP. So in this case, we'll need to downsample by some factor. And uh, we also need to, in the process, do some filtering in order to prevent things like aliasing and such. So at the end of the day, what the FPGA does is it treats that sampled data and brings it into uh, a, both a, a rate, a data rate, um, and, and treats the uh, sort of downsampled version of that digitized information such that then it can be packaged into uh, UDP packets and transmitted by gigabit Ethernet to your computer host. And here's an old school computer. Perhaps it has a flat screen monitor. Okay. And then what the computer host does is um, it takes those UDP packets, okay, and converts them into um, uh, using uh, lib usrp converts them into data that can be used by a program such as in this case, let's say we're running Simulink. So Simulink will then take the, um, the, the post-process UDB packets that the information being extracted from it using the libusrp library, and then it goes into Simulink, and that's the data that you'll see being fed out of, or being uh, transmitted out of the SDRU blocks into the rest of your model. So from end to end, we go from intercepting an over-the-air wireless signal to bringing it down to baseband, at the USRP N210, it's sampled, it's post-processed and downsampled uh, in, such that the computer host can handle it, it's packaged into UDP packets, and then it's fed into the computer host where the information is, is uh, uh, put into a software or a suite such as Simulink. Although there are a variety of USRP platforms that can be purchased, we'll be using the USRP N210 software-defined radio for this course. The USRP N210 consists of a gigabit ethernet interface that allows it to be connected to the host computer. Furthermore, um, it supports only one RF transceiver daughter card, which we'll talk about in a subsequent slide. Um, Although it does possess a computing device on board, a uh, Xilinx Spartan 3A DSP 3400 FPGA, um, this microprocessor system is primarily focused on performing sampling and filtering operations on the baseband data once it's been produced by the host computer and transmitted by the gigabit ethernet to the USRP and 210 device. Um, the main bottleneck, if you will, that connects the digital world with the analog world are the analog to digital and digital analog converters or ADCs and DACs um, on board the USRP N210. Um, regardless of how quickly the digital data is being generated by whatever sort of software, uh, software design suite you have on your host computer 
and uh, regardless of the analog waveform being received by the USRP N210, um, uh, all samples that are um, being processed for transmission as an analog waveform and all waveforms that are being converted into uh, digitized samples are constrained to 100 mega sample per second 14-bit resolution when we convert an analog waveform to a digital representation and a 400 mega sample per second 16-bit resolution digital analog conversion when we take digital samples and translate them into an analog waveform. So these are two of the hard numbers, if you will, that um, uh, the rest of our calculations for implementing uh, the baseband functionality and converting analog waveforms into a digital representation, these two numbers are, um, uh, are, are really the constraints that we have to work around when designing our system. Although we'll not be using it, uh, the USRP N210 is capable of MIMO or multiple input, multiple output communications um, via um, a MIMO cable that can be connected to two USRP devices. Um, since it's really difficult to build an RF daughter card front end that can support a wide range of transmission frequencies and uh, especially across multiple orders of magnitude, um, uh, as well as keeping the cost of the platform relatively affordable, uh, what Edis Research did is um, created a family of daughter cards that support different frequencies, uh, which can be purchased uh, individually um, by users for targeting specific applications. Um, and so as a result, uh, there are several uh, RF daughter cards that can be purchased and uh, depending on your application, can be switched in and switched out from your USRP N210 platform with, with, with uh, a small amount of work. Um, several sample RF daughter cards that are available are the basic TX and RX daughter cards that support frequencies from 1 to 250 megahertz. The XCVR2450 daughter card, which focuses on the 2.4 to 2.5 and 5.0 uh, ISM, uh, a gigahertz ISM uh, unlicensed frequency bands, which are excellent because suppose you want to do exper wireless experimentation, but you don't have a license in order to use a specific frequency, you can use this daughter card to use the unlicensed frequencies for your experiments. Finally, there's the WBX and SBX wideband transceivers, um, which are, uh, support uh, uh, frequencies from 50 megahertz to 2.2 gigahertz and 400 megahertz to 4.4 gigahertz. So these are very wide bands. Um, in this course, we'll be looking at we'll be using the SBX wideband uh, wideband with transceiver daughter card, uh, focusing specifically on the 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz ISM band. Now, the last important stage is the software that we'll be using in order to implement the baseband functionality of our digital communication system implementation um, in the software-defined radio. And there are a variety of options, um, including GNU Radio and GNU Radio Companion, which uh, provide a very, uh, very high-speed um, uh, and computationally intensive implementations of communication systems on the software fine radio, but the learning curve is rather steep and takes quite a while in order to become a master of these software environments. On the other hand, the Simulink interface, although it is somewhat limited in terms of the type of communication systems that you can implement, um, is very versatile, has a wealth of libraries and examples and blocks already available in Simulink and MATLAB that you can just take and glue together and implement advanced communication systems relatively quickly and then have it s simply interface with the USRP using the SDRU blocks in order to receive and transmit baseband data to the USRP device. So in this course, we will be exclusively using the Simulink interface and the Simulink environment in order to implement our software fine radio implementations of digital communication systems.